Okay, we will be recording this webinar um, so that those who are unable to join us today can join uh, can watch it later on. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type it in the chat box. Okay, and then we will try to take it up uh, at the end of the session and answer as many questions as we can. All right. So uh, with that, thank you very much and enjoy. I think you can take it away, Shavin. You're on mute, Charlene. Sorry, thanks, Francis. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, thanks very much, everyone, for joining us uh, for this uh, wonderful webinar. And I'm here to share with you our uh, Partnerships for Pangolins, which is really an introduction um, to the Singapore Pangolin Working Group. I'm Dr. Charlene, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the group, uh, together with Dr. Sonia. And I'm also a vet uh, at Wildlife Reserve Singapore. So for all of, uh, all of us who do celebrate, uh, happy Lunar New Year, and of course, happy World Pangolin Day. So to begin with, what is a pangolin? Well, pangolins are really unique mammals um, that are covered with scales. Um, they, they actually also do have some hair, as you can see in the bottom left-hand picture. And they also are very specialized feeders and they eat uh, ants and termites. And they are also active at night and very secretive. So what this means is that actually not very much is known about them. Um, however, when they are threatened, they do roll into a ball uh, as a defense mechanism. Um, and as you can see that in the bottom right hand picture, there are a total of eight pangolins uh, in the world, uh, four in Africa and four in Asia. So who is the Singapore Pangolin Working Group? We are um, a group of organizations and professional individuals who work together for pangolin conservation in Singapore. Um, so such as government agencies like the National Parks Board, conservation organizations like ACUS Conservation International, Nature Society of Singapore, Strix Wildlife Consultancy, Wild, uh, Pangolin Story, Wildlife Reserve Singapore. We also partner uh, educational institutions such as NIE, NTU, NUS, as well as other professional individuals. And we don't just work in Singapore, we also work very closely with regional partners and we also update the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And this is really sort of like the, the world governing body for nature conservation. And within the IUCN, we um, work specifically with the Pangolin Specialist Group and also the Asian Species Action Partnership. And before I go on to describe a bit about what we do, why do we do what we do? Um, all over the world, pangolin populations are declining. And in fact, they are the most trafficked wildlife mammal uh, in the world. So much so that in some areas, there already has been some uh, local extinctions that have occurred. All eight species of pangolins are protected under both international and national agreements and laws. So what's causing pangolin populations um, to decline? Um, globally, pangolins, uh, the greatest threats that pangolins face is hunting and poaching, mainly for their scales and meat. Uh, it is believed that pangolin scales have medicinal value. However, pangolin scales are actually made of keratin, just like your hair and your fingernails. And there is no known scientific evidence um, that consuming pangolin scales is of, uh, of any value. Pangolins are also faced with habitat alteration and loss. And what this really means is that they're losing their homes to urban uh, and ag agricultural development. And uh, in some areas, uh, pangolins are also faced with road kills. Also, what's really important is that the environmental health, animal health, whether it's domestic or wildlife, and also human health are all interlinked. And so for us to be healthy, our environment, um, animal health uh, also has to be healthy. And um, you know, certainly the fact that we are uh, currently in this pandemic situation um, is, is uh, you know, sort of encapsulates that. And this is really the one health concept that we're all interlinked. Just give me a second. And how is this relevant to Singapore? Well, just a couple of years ago, more than 37 tons of pangolin scales uh, were confiscated. And while Singapore was not directly involved in the hunting of these pangolins, because Singapore is such a big trade hub, um, you know, a lot of wildlife trade, both legal and illegal, come through our shores. And that's how our authorities uh, intercepted these three very large shipments. 
And we do have one species of pangolin that's found here naturally uh, on our shores, and that's the Sunda pangolin. This species is recognized both internationally and nationally as critically endangered. About uh, 20 pangolins are rescued per year on average. And in Singapore, we're in a very unique situation in that um, the greatest threats to pangolins here is not hunting and poaching, but actually road kills and accidents. And in fact, one of our speakers later will be covering this. And so what do we actually do? So as a working group, we collaborate with uh, um, for the conservation of pangolins uh, in Singapore through activities um, such as uh, rescue, rehabilitation and release. We also work to reduce uh, road kills and to improve urban wildlife management. We are also involved in research on pangolins, including topics such as ecology, nutrition and healthcare. And we're also involved in education programs that help to increase the awareness of pangolin conservation in Singapore. And we also work to mitigate the illegal, illegal pangolin trade in Singapore and also beyond our shores. In fact, in 2018, the Sunda uh, Pangolin National Conservation Strategy and Action Plan was launched. And this actually helps to guide um, all our activities for pangolin conservation in Singapore for the next 50 years and beyond. And this action plan was launched together with um, the release of a hand-raised uh, pangolin, which one of our speakers will share with you later too. And ultimately, what we really want, we want a thriving population of pangolins in Singapore with safe, well-connected habitats, and also a Singapore that's you and me and all of us that is proud of this natural heritage. So what can you do to help? Well, to begin with, get out there, you know, explore our wild spaces. We are very privileged in Singapore to have such wonderful wild spaces that are that's so easily accessible. Um, but at the same time, we also have to, to behave responsibly. Um, we can certainly appreciate and respect our wildlife, but do admire and observe them from a distance. And even simple acts of even things like, you know, uh, uh, disposing of your rubbish responsibly is a big help. Of course, you know, be aware, get out there, be aware of conservation issues faced by pangolins. And the very fact that you're here joining us for this webinar is fantastic and there's plenty more that you can do. And if you remember, the greatest global threat to pangolins is uh, poaching and hunting. So don't support the trade, don't buy pangolin products. And this applies not just here nationally, but even you know, beyond our shores and online. And also, if you remember, the greatest threat to pangolins being faced here in Singapore is actually road kills and road accidents. So drive responsibly, especially around our green spaces. And what this means is slow down, look out for wildlife and be ready to react appropriately. And this will make our roads safer, not just for pangolins and wildlife or other uh, animals, but also for humans. And if you come across an injured or a dead pangolin or a pangolin being poached or trapped, this requires uh, immediate attention. So do report it um, straight away. The two numbers provided here on the screen are for the, uh, the calls, so the numbers for NPARCs and ACRES hotlines. And these hotlines are managed 24 hours. You can also follow our blog. Um, the address is right there. This blog is updated periodically with you know, interesting facts and information about pangolins and also um, you know, potential activities that you could be involved in uh, for pangolin conservation from time to time. And if you do see a pangolin, we would love to hear about it. Um, on uh, our website is a link to uh, a form that you can enter in the citing details. And these sightings actually help to contribute to a better understanding of uh, pangolin population distribution and also how this population changes over time. And so your sightings help uh, to contribute to the research that we do. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. Happy Pangolin, uh, World, happy World Pangolin Day again and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Okay. Thanks a lot, Charlene. Um, that was a really great intro to the work of SPWG. I'm um, just going to invite Ade to join us now. Hello. 
let me just uh, share my screen. Can you guys see it? Looks good, thanks. All right, uh, hello everyone. My name is Adi and I'm with the carnivores, marsupials and small mammals team at the zoo. And today I'll be sharing with you our experience rehabilitating and releasing one of our hand-reared tuna penguins. Uh, this was a joint program, a uh, joint project between WRS and NPARKS. So I think um, Charlene's covered about penguins, right? Like about tuna penguins. And the individual that we released was a tuna penguin. So I'll just skip this. Now in Singapore, you can find uh, animals in specific areas and, and mainly in the CCNR. And the Sunda penguins can be found there. They're forest dwelling animals. Uh, and that's also where the zoo is located, right? This is a CCNR. Um, they can also be found in the offshore islands of Ubin and Tokong. And other than penguins, you can see that we have also colugos, lorises, and also mouse deers living in Singapore in the same habitats. As mentioned, uh, roadkill is a main threat for penguins in Singapore and surrounding that CCNR that I showed you earlier are major roads and expressways, such as the BKE, Thompson and Mandai Road. And these, these roads have been highlighted as roadkill hotspots. Yeah? But why do penguins cross roads? So they do this either to look for food or as they disperse outwards uh, and they want to occupy new individual home ranges, they end up on roads as they travel to different areas. So what happens to injured, sick, or displaced animals? Now, these animals are typically rescued by acres or end parks or occasionally by members of public. And then they're brought over to, to the zoo if they're sick or injured, and then they're treated by Charlene and her colleagues. And this process can take a while, you know. Um, otherwise, they're released. And this release is often not monitored. And this is considered soft release because you can't um, realistically monitor every single release that we do. This is quite uh, logistically um, very resource intensive, basically. So aside from uh, rescue rehab of native penguins with end parks and acres, uh, we do other things such as uh, research and we do a lot of education. And, and as Charlene mentioned, we, we push a lot of partnerships and initiatives, uh, both locally and internationally. Now on to the main story. So in 2017, uh, we received a very young animal uh, which weighed about 5.52 grams. So we estimated him to be about one and a half months old. And this pangolin needed milk, yeah? Because they, they're fully weaned at about three months old or so. Um, now this specimen was hand reared by a former vet, Dr. Serena, and her kids gave the pangolin the name of Sentru, right? Um, named after one of the um, Pokemon creatures. Yeah. So the goal of this, this phase, when, whenever you receive a young animal like this, is to ensure that uh, the animal is, grows healthily. And at the same time, uh, we allow it to go undergo weaning, the process in which uh, it goes from milk to solids as promptly as possible because, you know, it, he can't be a baby forever and, you know, drink milk forever. Yeah. So over at the top, you can see the timeline of, of the events uh, and I'll share with you more as we go along. Now, as with any hand rearing phase, um, uh, you know, it would involve a lot of milk. Yeah? Uh, aside from feeding uh, milk, we also uh, bring the animals out for walks, uh, you know, to get them to exercise, to learn to climb, be exposed to wild foods such as ants. And you can see this video on the right. So weaver ants are one of the main uh, ant species that pangolins eat. So they need to be exposed very early in the in, in, in the young so that they know what to eat in the wild. Yeah? And at the same time, climbing, digging, and things like that, these are natural behaviors that pangolins need to be familiar with. So during the rehab phase or the hand rearing phase, uh, this is exposed to the animal. And you can see that um, Panglin is just busy digging away. Now, of course, these are natural behaviors, but you still need to 
expose these animals to such behaviors because um because that's expected of them in the wild now as i mentioned the hand rearing phase involves uh giving sand shrew milk and this milk was formulated especially for him and he was fed multiple times a day just like any baby um, and as with any hand rearing or, or raising any babies, there's going to be a lot of hiccups. Uh, he had issues accepting the teeth, you know, he had issues uh, def uh, defecating uh, and occasionally he had like bloating issues. And this is kind of expected and, and we treated it accordingly. Uh, eventually, we weaned him off and this weaning process is gradual. And so we switched from bottle feeding to then uh, feeding on the dish and then from feeding on the dish, we introduced ants eggs and then over time the milk was removed and he was on solids completely and as you can see below you can see a little weight chart a uh, growth chart uh, he, he grew quite steadily over the course of uh, three months or more yeah now the next part was to bring him over to the night safari um, because the process in which to release an animal into the wild you, you still need to do a lot of um, preparation and things like that so the discussion about his release began but a lot of prep work needed to be done and the animal needed to be bigger before we released him and i'll show you why so the goal of this phase while he was with us was to maintain healthy growth and retain the wild behaviors and minimize habituation to us um, i was one of the keepers with him together with the rest of the team and we would give him occasionally uh wild ants weaver ants you know um, when we can, we'll find things like termites. Um, but at the same time, uh, we try to practice minimize handling so that he wouldn't he wouldn't be too attached to us. Now, eventually, he, he you know I said that he started out five five two grams, and uh, by the time we finished all our planning, he was uh, six and a half kg. <laughs> so, but but this was important because he needed to be at an acceptable size and weight because the tag, the tag that we would attach to him later on, uh, would be maximum 5% of his whole body weight, but it's still pretty tiny. But more importantly is that the scales is where we attach the, scale, uh, the tag. So the scales need to be thick and large enough so that the tags can, can be secured onto it uh, properly without it breaking easily. Yeah. And you can see him uh, being quite chunky here. So monitoring animals after they're being released uh, is part of the soft release approach. So as opposed to just releasing them just like that, that's the hard release approach. So we decided to go with the soft release approach because we want to know uh, whether he would survive out there and, and if he had any issues, we could intervene uh, accordingly. Uh, this is also inclusive of other rehabilitation work so that uh, the animal has a better chance of surviving in the wild. And I'll show you shortly what that means. Um, now, we, we weren't able to get a GPS tag because of some logistical issue, but we settled with this really lightweight uh, radio tag. Yeah, so holes were made uh, into the scale and then the tag was then attached using a fishing line and some glue. And during this whole process, we made sure that Sancho had a clean bill of health before we released him. Now this process uh, or this transfer to the soft release site was a pretty big deal. Uh, we, this was a, a joint project, as I mentioned, with NPARCS. Uh, we had the minister uh, Desmond Lee as a guest of honor for this release as well. And we made the box especially heavy for, for him to carry. I, I kid, by the way. Um, so the next part is the release uh, to the soft release enclosure. So. This was an enclosure in this, the area that we would be releasing him at. Um, the idea is to <clears throat> reinforce wild behaviors again, but at the same time to expose the specimen to the elements. Now we chose a location with pangolin presence, obviously because we wanted um, the animal to have food and resources that a pangolin needs and they need to be in the area. At the same time, it needed to be accessible enough for us to do uh, our constant monitoring work. <clears throat> so this was the soft release enclosure that we built for him. It was a, his private little uh, um, enclosure. And then we made some effort to, to camouflage it. 
And obviously, it can't be just a plain enclosure. We had to put the kind of things that Pangolin needs in the enclosure, such as layers of soil and different substrates and <clears throat> some branches and some hiding spots and a nest box to keep him uh, dry and away from the light. And as, as, as mentioned before, uh, pangolins are nocturnal, so they tend to prefer dark areas. Yeah? And aside from a nest box, we, you know, we gave him water, obviously and places where he can eat yeah now this was him um just moments after we brought him over about one hour two hours after he brought him over and we put camera traps in the in the enclosure so that we, we would know when he would be active you know to figure out his activity pattern so this will be useful much later when we do the release the proper release yeah now, at one occasion, on one occasion, we we almost uh, we thought we almost we lost we almost we thought we lost him, you know, but apparently uh, he he made a really deep burrow about 30, 30 or fifty cm deep, and uh, we dug him out. Uh, that particular um, period, it was super dry, and and I I believe he went in to 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 feel a bit more cool underneath the ground. Yeah? Now, the, the reason why we took him to the soft release enclosure was also to ensure that the tag uh, would stay on. So, so we wanted the tag to, to get a bit of abuse before he goes out into the wild. And true enough, or well, not true enough, uh, uh, unfortunately, the tag sort of got loose while he was in this enclosure, which is a good thing. So we brought him back, we fixed it, with, uh, we, we reinforced it and everything, and then we brought him back to the soft release enclosure. Now, about one month after him being in the enclosure, we opened up the doors and thus began our post-release uh, monitoring phase. And the point of this phase, of course, was to ensure that the animal will survive and we would intervene if, if necessary. Yeah. Now, this is the kind of habitat that uh, we had to face and the kind of habitat that Pangolin is like. Uh, so Singapore is not really known for primary forests and, and mostly it's full of secondary forests which have a lot of undergrowth. So undergrowth was, was uh, one of the main challenges because we weren't allowed to damage the vegetation. Uh, we released him also during the uh, wet weather, uh, during the monsoon season, end of the year. Uh, this was also, which made it really difficult because you know thunderstorms and everything. Um, because radio tracking also is very intensive, very manpower intensive. So um, you need to be there every day. You know, it's not like uh, uh, with a GPS tag, you can just do it. Um, um, off-site essentially um, and with the forest being as thick as this uh, it sometimes hinders the, the transmission of the of the signal um, so this was the first night the night that we released him uh, this was the first and last time we saw him after we released him uh, we, we used a thermal camera and you can see the thing on the left side that's that's his tag Yeah. Um, so as I've mentioned, the method that we used was uh, to track it with a radio, radio tag. And uh, how it works is that the tag is the transmitter. And then the thing that we hold in the hand, the antenna, would receive these, uh, these signals, right? So in a forested environment, uh, the detection range can be a lot shorter. And then the, you sometimes get interference from, from a lot of the features like, like hills and burrows and you can imagine the penguins dig burrows so that would add to the to the whole issue uh, we plan to initially track him 24 7 but um, it was a bit bit of a lofty goal so eventually we ended up just tracking him in the daytime just to look for him uh, his sleeping sites basically now just more photos of us tracking and you can see we have a lot of staff helping us including Charlene there now, eventually, um, so this is basically how he moved. You know, he would spend spend a couple of nights uh, in one area. Uh, as you can see, A, B, C, and D. And then he would sleep there for a couple of days. And then he'll move on to another place. You know, you, can, you might notice that there are like gaps in, in the timeline. Uh, and that's because we lost him for a couple of days here and there. So we had to look for him. Yeah. So eventually, we... The, the tag didn't move for close to at least five days. And we were like, okay, where, where is this guy? You know, um, we were afraid that he, he was, he was dead, you know, 
So we went to you know look for the tag, um, and you can imagine the thing is super tiny. And eventually, one of our uh, collaborators, Helen, um, she found the tag, and it was without the antenna. But the good thing was, uh, Sanchu wasn't there, so we were quite uh, sure that he didn't just die there and and the, the scale fell off or something. So we <clears throat> we hoped that he survived and and moved on. Um, we tracked for almost three weeks. And we learned quite a lot from the whole experience. Um, so a lot of things that we could improve, you know, like you know, improving the hand rearing formula, um, getting him to be more exposed to different types of behavior, such as, for example, swimming. As, as some of you might know, penguins actually can swim. Um, expose him to a larger variety of wild foods, uh, not just weaver ants, because they eat a lot of different types of ants and termites out there. Um, and yet soft release enclosure can obviously be a lot bigger. Um, and GPS tag could be one of the things um, to look at in future with, also, with good attachment techniques. So currently we're looking into uh, improving the attachment techniques, not just using fishing lines and glue, but uh, as you can see in the picture there, like a bolt and um, belt kind of uh, set up there. Uh, selecting optimal months for tracking is also important because if you do it in a dry season, then you can probably track it for a longer period of time. And obviously, uh, you need a dedicated team for this, right? So by now, you should know that it takes a village you know, just to do something like this. You know, We had a lot of help from, from our staff and also from end parks. And uh, you can also do your part, like what Charlene said. Yeah. So with that, uh, I end my talk and like to thank... Um, my team in WRS and, and the different departments there, as well as and parks as well, because they, they provided a lot of technical support for this project. Yep. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Ade. That was super cool. Um, and now I want to pass over the time to Kalai. Hi, everyone. Um, morning, everyone. Happy New Year and uh, happy Pangolin Day as well. Uh, let me just get this shared. Francis, you can see, right? Uh, so sharing, yep, looks good. Okay. If you can just put it in presentation mode. Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay, my name is Kalai. I'm going to share a bit about the uh, rescue work that uh, we do in Singapore with regards to Sunda pangolins. Um, I'll be um, sharing some videos as well. So um, that will give you a glimpse as to what are some of the issues these animals face in Singapore. But first, just a quick uh summary of what acres i mean uh, we try to be a voice for the voiceless um, we have five focus areas so one of it is rescue uh, but we also tackle the illegal wildlife trade and we do a lot of educational work as well so uh, just to give a bit of background in 2020 we got about 15,000 calls to our hotline uh, which is the most number of calls ever and we rescued about 4,000 animals um, so we do rescue a whole spectrum of uh, species, and Sunda penguins are one of them. Um, Sunda penguins are usually the animals that a lot of our staff and volunteers are looking forward to rescue as well. But um, we hope we don't get to, because if we have to rescue them, it usually means they are in some sort of trouble. So there's a few ways that uh, we try to help penguins. One is, of course, through uh, education. So, you know, uh, we believe that we need to reach out to the young. Um, a lot of youngsters these days, um, they all know about a lot of the wildlife out there, like tigers and lions and hippos. But uh, most people don't know about Sunda pangolins and the problems they face or the fact that Singapore is home to the most um, trafficked mammal in the world. So we try to uh, include all these elements into our educational work. So as kids grow up, they, they know more about our biodiversity that can be found in Singapore. Um, we also have a crime investigation unit um, that you know, looks at the trade. Uh, we do surveys online as well. Um, if you go back maybe a decade, uh, tiger parts, bear bile, um, all these things could be found uh, even in TCM shops and all that. And over a period of time working with the authorities, we have managed to uh, cut all that down. But we still have to be vigilant because we never know uh, what could be smuggled in uh, through, through or to Singapore. 
uh, apart from that also about poaching as well while we are yet to uh, really know if anyone is poaching pangolins in Singapore we are aware that sometimes there are snares there are traps left out for other animals uh, whether it be to, to trap or snare a wild boar or even to snap snare a bird um, but you know pangolins can become victims of these snares they can become bycatch so we need to be very vigilant uh, and be on the lookout for all these uh, traps as well um, or even a fishing line you know uh, can entangle a pangolin as well um, so this is another way that we try to help pangolins or wild animals in general i think one of the important things to note is that um, sometimes helping any animal in general uh, protecting them we are also helping pangolins in the process um, and of course, pangolin sightings and roadkill, that video that you see on the right, I hope you all can see the video. Uh, that was a pangolin uh, climbing a palm tree just a few days ago. And on the extreme left uh, was a roadkill um, that unfortunately we came across uh, earlier this year. So there are sightings in, in Singapore. Um, a lot of times we actually don't get to rescue them. They actually appear and then they disappear. So, um, but however, all this data can be very valuable uh, to give us more insight on where these animals are found, where they are crossing. Uh, a lot of our green spaces are now, you know, separated by roads. So, which are the uh, roads that we should focus on to maybe put uh, mitigation uh, uh, measures to, to reduce road kills as well. Um, and of course, we also in the process uh, retrieve carcasses uh, as and when we are, we are able to, if we come across them. Um, and of course, we also do a 24-hour wildlife rescue where we rescue pangolins, which will be the focus uh, of today. So um, over the last decade, we have rescued more than 100 pangolins in Singapore. Um, so whenever somebody sees a pangolin that is near a road or is, no, is wandering around, uh, we try to rush down as soon as possible to retrieve the animal. Um, and also, we do have a rescue center uh, where, you know, if needed, uh, if the animal needs some short-term care or overnight care where maybe it needs a bit of warmth or needs a bit of fluids, we are able to do that as well. Um, a lot of time, the pangolins are found close to roads and that is usually uh, the biggest concern here. So even if they cross a road and stray away, we will try to take the animal out and, and totally relocate it to somewhere much safer. So I will share a few videos. I really hope the videos play. And then I'll just run through uh, each and every one of them. So this was um, uh, quite a few years back when my hair was a bit longer. Um, so this pangolin was actually uh, really stuck uh, in there. So this is actually in the, in the western side of Singapore. Uh. So the pangolin had gotten there, climbed into it, and uh, part of the scales were actually kind of caught onto the glass panels as well. So this is one of the problems of pangolins. Um, sometimes, you know, they, they are able to squeeze in, in and out of small gaps and everything, um, but sometimes they do get stuck. So this is one of the situations uh, similar to, similar to the picture on the top right here where the pangolin is stuck on the football net. Um, this is something that we have come across uh, quite a few times. And um, usually these things happen in the middle of the night where nobody notices. So, uh, and, and only in the morning or in the daytime, somebody sees them. And sometimes by then the animal could be quite badly dehydrated or could be badly uh, injured as well or bruised because the, you know, the strings and the gopos, uh, the netting can get caught in the scales as well. So sometimes these are very urgent cases that we need to attend to. Um, the one that you see the bottom, uh, second photo from the right, uh, that was a pangolin that was literally inside the MRT station. So that is another worry. It was actually uh, on the middle of the road, but members of public kind of ushered it into the MRT station where it was safer. Uh, so that's when we intervened uh, to rescue the pangolin as well. And at the bottom right is another one that had entered the undercarriage of a vehicle. Um, that is usually a, a nightmare situation because 
the moment they enter into a confined space with a lot of wires and, 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 and parts and everything, they can get a good hold uh, of wherever they are holding on to. So it becomes very difficult to uh, rescue them. Um, it's the same issue we have for other animals like pangol uh, pythons as well when they enter into a confined area. Um, so speaking of the vehicle, uh, this is another two videos of the same rescue. So this was a rather large uh, pangolin that we got. I, I, if I remember correctly, it was about 12 kilos or 12.5 kilos. Um, it was in a basement car park and it went under her vehicle. And I'm not sure what it, its intention was, but it probably got spooked off a bit by the security guard of the area and it decided to go into the car. So this whole process took us uh, 45 minutes to slowly uh, remove the pangolin because uh, one of the first issues we had to do was uh, jack up the car and we can't just jack up the car without the owner's permission. So we had to wait and find ways to contact the owner of the vehicle. Uh, and then we got his permission Then we jacked up the vehicle and slowly tried to remove the pangolin. Um, of course, there are a few ways you can do this. I think I'm not a vet, but I think probably we can, you know, uh, give it a slight uh, uh, sedation as well to remove it. But sometimes, you know, uh, we are out of time, we are rushing against time as well. So we had to slowly pry the pangolin from all the cables and everything uh, that it was holding on to. So it took quite a while to do this. So that's the other video. So you can see he's just chilling down there. Um, but I think part of his tail was still stuck somewhere. So we had to, we had to remove uh, that part as well from the vehicle. So we never look forward to such cases uh, as exciting or, or interesting as it is. Uh, it, it can be very stressful for the animal. Uh, so uh, generally we don't like to rescue any type of animal from uh, inside of a vehicle. Uh, this was just recently, a few days ago, actually, uh, where this pangolin is a juvenile, or rather it's a young one. Uh, it was roaming the entire HDB estate and um, finally found itself in the middle of this palm tree uh, where somehow it kind of got its tail entangled in uh, some uh, plastic and rubbish. So um, this pangolin had actually crossed several roads to, before it settled down in that spot. And also in the process got chased by some community cats as well, which was uh, kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, um, this pangolin is lucky because it had a lot of members of public or rather two boys who were helping to keep vehicles away, uh, stopping vehicles to let the pangolin cross back and forth a small road. So this is uh, one of the issues they have where, um, I don't know, they, as a species, they tend to be a bit oblivious to the surroundings. And when they cross the road, they just move around without even noticing uh, um, headlights coming at them. So that is one of the big concerns uh, that this species has in Singapore. Uh, again, this was just a few days ago. So this is the reality. Uh, this case was interesting because nobody even called us. Uh, we were actually going back to our center uh, after a night full of rescues, and we just stumbled upon this pangolin crossing a road. So it gives us a glimpse to what they actually do. And, and you know, if it was a busy road, uh, this guy would have gotten run over uh, because they're so low to the ground. Usually it's quite hard to spot them as well. So this is a classic example where uh, this location, the animal is crossing from an area uh, where there's a lot of green spaces to another area where there is a lot of green spaces. Um, so the roads are, are a major issue here for them. Um, even though he had safely crossed the road, uh, we still, we still took him out of the place to give him a full check. You know, we, um, the WRS does check for microchip and whatever other valuable data we can get before relocating him, uh, deeper into the forest where it's much safer. And this was during circuit breaker last year. Uh, where a kind member of public called us about this pangolin that uh, crossed, uh, was actually very near a road, uh, was just along the road shoulder um, and decided to climb this small tree. So uh, we, we got some nice footage of it as well. 
So, I mean, pangolins are able to climb very well, um, just like how they can swim. Uh, but this is beside a road. So there's a high chance that eventually when it does come down, it's going to cross some road again. So we're not going to take any chances. So you can see um, how he's chilling on top of the tree. And um, you'll be able to see that the road is just beside. So even for cases like this, we have to take the animal out of there because uh, we can't take any risk with him getting run over. So such re rescues, quite straightforward, but you know, usually uh, the only risk we have are you know, climbing ladders and, and all that issues. Um, so I have to just safely remove him and then uh, we bring it over to WRS where they do the rest of all the hard work. So grabbing the pangolin by the tail, uh, it, it is quite safe. Their tail is very strong. Um, so they're, they're perfectly fine to be held that way for a short period of time. This was another one. Um, it is literally in the middle of the road, on the road divider. And it had actually sustained some injuries to the tail. You might be able to notice. Um, but it decided to sleep for the day or rest. But this pangolin, when we got it, it, it did seem a bit you know, stressed out and probably in a bit of shock. We're not sure what happened to it. But it dug a small hole there to kind of make itself comfortable in. And you can see the vehicle zooming past left and right. Um, so yeah, we uh, we are very, very lucky that a member of public somehow noticed this animal uh, just from the other side of the road. So this guy was also sent to WRS. Uh, I believe uh, already been treated for his injuries and he should be back in the wild as well. So you notice how he was in a ball, but uh, once you're no longer handling him, he, he uncurls himself and starts exploring already. Wow. And uh, that is just some of the cases I wanted to share with you all. And I'll just end with this uh, very sweet, very beautiful video of a mother and baby pangolin that we released uh, last year. So you can see the baby actually latching onto the mom as he walks away into the forest. Okay, um, that is my talk. Pretty fast, actually. But thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, yeah, thanks, Francis. Thanks, Kalai. That was great. And such a sweet video at the end um, <laughs> that really just shows our video. I mean, our, our logo, right? Um, yeah. So we do have quite a bit of time now to, to field some questions. And I think we have quite a lot of questions happening in the chat. Um, so I'm just going to share uh, this slide. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen for some of the... Can you see my screen? Yeah? Okay. Um, so if I can just invite Kalai, Ade, and uh, Charlene um, to come back on. Um, we, cannot, we can just take a couple of the questions that people have been uh, putting into the chat, but also sending to us via email. Okay, so for this uh, very first question, um, someone asked if there have been cases of uh, pangolins being poached in the wild in Singapore. Would anyone want to try? <laughs> it could be a yes or no answer. <laughs> um. Hi, thanks, thanks very much for the question. Um, I believe there has been uh, some suspicions of uh, poaching in, in Singapore, um, but we're not at liberty to, to reveal any uh, details of that. Okay, thanks, Charlene. Okay, and then um, the next question, um, someone was curious about um, how you decide which location to release the pangolin um, after you rehabilitate it. Maybe either Ade or Kala, you want to take this one? Are you re referring to the Henriot one or like just the other ones that are treated? Or... That's a good question. So maybe yeah. Ade, you take the Henriot one. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Um, so, so like I mentioned, uh, location is really important. So, uh, you want an area where there are pangolins because uh, you want to make sure that this pangolin that you're releasing has um, access to food and, and shelter and things like that. Uh, at the same time, you want it to be released in an area that is uh, relatively far from from um, from urban areas, right, and roads and things like that. Uh, the area that we released him also had dogs, but that was uh, like feral dogs, yeah? but that was just an un unfortunate, um, um, you know, factor. But dogs didn't really dis disturb the animal, so that, that was fine. Um, other than that, you know, there's not much choice in Singapore to begin with, lah. You know, we, we only have these main areas, you know, like I mentioned before, like CCNR and some of the couple um, other areas like Kalai mentioned the West. Uh, but again, uh, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Ade. Um, and I guess uh, we'll just move on to the next question. So, okay, another one about the rehab phase. How do you make sure the pangolins don't get too comfortable with people? Yeah, so, so during the hand rearing phase, obviously the animal is going to be really attached to you. Um, but then, I, I don't know if you all noticed it, it the animal was in, in Night Safari for almost one and a half years. So during this period, we, we made conscious effort not to, you know, like handle it too much. Um, you know, like even when we take it up for walks, it was, you know, very, very minimal handling um, and basically give him his own space. And, and not uh, use him for contact and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I could add on to that also, Adi. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, so Adi pretty much captured, you know, all the uh, the main points with uh, considerations for rehabilitation, and you know the um you know these sort of thoughts apply not just to pangolins but also all other wildlife that are under human care uh, and undergoing rehab. Um, you know, so we also make sure or try and ensure that, you know, the environment that we provide them is as natural as possible and, you know, certainly minimize human handling, human uh, exposure. Um, and especially for um, uh, uh, wildlife to be released, um, we try to ensure that they have access to wild food as early as possible. So that, you know, recognition um, uh, of wild food is, is really important, you know, after they're released, for example. Uh, Kalai, do you have anything else to add um, to this question? Um, I, I mean, I mean, um, at Acres, we we have not rehabilitated pangolins, uh, so I, I can't say much. But uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't have much to say about this. Yeah, okay. but but when we rescue them, uh, of course, like, with any wild animals, we, we keep our interaction uh, less. Uh, what I can say is sometimes uh, we do come across other animals. Let's say raptors. Or even squirrels and civets, where when people find them in an injured or stressed up situation, um, they they sometimes uh, unknowingly make the situation worse by you know uh, offering the animal water or forcing the animal to drink something uh, because they, they think the animal is dehydrated or needs help, uh, or, or start petting the animal uh, and all that. Um, so, but for wild animals, it generally makes the situation worse lah. So that much I can say. So when we rescue the animal, uh, as long as it's fine, we keep handling to a minimum because we don't want to stress the animal. Uh, and yeah, then we just do whatever is needed. Okay, cool. Thanks, everybody. Um, so for the next question, oops. Okay. Somebody asked if pangolins are territorial. Yeah, to, to a certain degree, they are. Um, they do occupy their own areas. Um, the males can be aggressive to other males. Uh, we can confirm that. Um, and typically, a, a female's territory would be within... They, they occupy a much smaller space uh, compared to the males. Um, and the males are actually the ones that typically we find... Um, are coming out of the forest actually and, and occupying more spaces or trying to find new new spaces. So mm -hmm. that's 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 my feed my my input on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Adi. Okay. 
And then, because just now you mentioned that penguins can swim, right? So someone has a very nice question. If they can swim, can they also eat small fish? <laughs> well, well, they can swim, but I think maybe we didn't mention this, right? But uh, the penguins, are they are only ant and termite eaters. So uh, I have some videos, but I don't know if I can share them here. Um, basically, they have this long sticky tongue, right? And it's designed to just uh, capture... Uh, ants, just like in the in the picture there, right? Uh, ants and termites, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the claws are used for for destroying termite mounds and 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 hills and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't really have okay. teeth as well, so they can't really <laughs> eat anything uh, bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the good question. Um, Okay, and someone was curious about road kills. Um, just to find out uh, what the current mitigation measures are. Um, to prevent road kills for pangolins or I guess wildlife in general. This is um this is a really great question. Uh, there there are many things you know that are being worked on by you know by numerous agencies and individuals uh you know all throughout the the country, um, and. Uh, so some of the, the measures include things like ensure, uh, trying to improve habitat connectivity so that the animals can avoid, you know, going onto the roads completely, then, you know, they'd be much more safe from, from road accidents. So this is ensuring that our greens, uh, our wild spaces are, are well connected. Um, so an example of this would be, for example, the eco bridge, you know, that goes over the, the BKE so that animals, you know, from one side of the, the bridge, uh, one side of the highway can actually cross over to the other safely. Um, um, some of the other considerations are also perhaps, you know, like under underground bridges, which you may not see, but actually um, animals do use them to cross from one side to the other. Um, perhaps exclusion measures also, you know, along the sides of the roads uh, where uh, animals where they, they might try to cross the road and then come across these exclusion devices and then are, are deterred from actually getting onto the roads instead. You know, and even things like, and you know, uh, even simple things like uh, road calming measures. So making sure or trying to ensure that that drivers drive responsibly, you know, slow down um, uh, around, especially around our green spaces or areas that we know are hotspots. You know, all of these measures, you know, together with others that we are trialing, uh, we're helping to or aiming to reduce the road kills in Singapore. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. And thanks for the great answer too, Charlene. Um, okay, we do have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to uh, ask a couple of questions that are uh, on the chat. But also there was one other question on whether or not the tags and the bolts that go on the pangolins actually hurt them. They don't. <laughs> they're they're kind of <laughs> like, you know, if you pierce your own hair you know, or, or poke your... The, the, the part of your nails that sticks out, you know, it doesn't really hurt, right? Um, um, and, and there are no nerves or anything on the scale itself, so it doesn't hurt them. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, if, if uh, it gets snagged onto something and, you know, it pulls their scale, then it might, it would definitely hurt, yeah. Mm. Okay. Add yeah. just a little bit to that. So um, the pangolin scales, um, are these completely uh, right? Just to give you an idea, the pangolin scales are sort of shaped a bit, you know, like, like a triangle, right? Um, and, and the long part actually is connected, you know, to the skin and the body, but the end of it is actually free. And that allows, you know, a lot of mobility in the scales and when the pangolin curls up, um, it helps to, you know, to protect uh, the body. So the, the bolts and the tags actually go on the free end of the scale. And, you know, when we, um, when we put in the, the, the tags, we, we ensure that, you know, if we, if we do make a hole in the scale, it's on the free end. Obviously, you know, we, we don't uh, uh, hurt the, the skin and the, and the living tissue. Um, um, and yeah, and otherwise it's as a, I hope that gives you like a better idea, you know, sort of how the, the tags themselves don't actually uh, hurt the, the pangolins. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Um, so I'm just going to read in the chat now because there's an interesting question as well. Um, when pangolins eat, uh, do they get bitten by the ants or do they get bothered by that? Do they have some kind of anti-venom that protects them? <laughs> Uh, they don't have an anti-venom uh, that, that we know of. Uh, pangolins do have pretty tough skin, a uh, pretty thick skin. 
um, they in general they they don't seem to to be bothered too much um, by the ends. I, I'm sure they, they get bitten because you know sometimes we see ends really clinging on, you know, to the skin, right, Adi? Mm. Um, uh, but in general, they they're not too bothered um, by the ends um, biting them. Okay, cool and good to know. I think people are really interested in the scales now because someone else has asked, and this will be the last question: um, Can the scales regrow? Um, due to the tags because you have to like sort of bolt it through or like remove a part of it right will they regrow uh we we don't think the scales themselves if the scales have been damaged at the, at the base basically where the um uh where it's connected to the living skin and tissue if that part is uh is is damaged we don't think that the scales um do regrow and certainly at the free end um uh they, those those part of the scales certainly don't seem to to grow as well um and in fact some of the very old pangolins that come in you know that come in with some damage to the scales at the end you know just from, from natural um occurrences you know, getting caught on on thorns or whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. those pangolin scales with the chips don't don't seem to grow back. Mm. Okay, yeah, thanks, Shaleen, Kala, and Ade. Um, I want to ask if one more question is okay, just because um, I mean we are living in times of COVID, and somebody is wondering if um, there was and there's any research to prove or to disprove that pangolins hold the COVID virus. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, that's another great question. Um, so no, the uh, the virus that specifically causes, you know, our current COVID-19 um, disease has not been identified uh, in pangolins. Um, and, you know, bearing in mind also that, that COVID-19 um, and the virus that causes it is primarily a disease of humans. You know, and it's also transmitted, you know, from humans to humans, and it causes disease within humans. So there have been some cases, you know, as uh, uh, as we know, of humans transmitting the disease um, to and uh, to animals, both domestic and wildlife. Um, but as far as we know, this virus has not been found uh, in pangolins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I think that's all the time we have for questions today, but I really want to extend my gratitude to Charlene, Kala, and Ade for um, putting together this really great presentation and sharing with us their experiences with pangolins on World Pangolin Day. Um, so happy World Pangolin Day, everybody, and have a good weekend.